All right, on behalf of the authors at Google and Tech Talks at Google teams here at Google Santa Monica, welcome. Uh, I'm Chris DeFay, and uh, I'm very pleased to uh, welcome Greg Ridgway of the RAND Corporation. Ridgway is the director of the RAND Safety and Justice Program and director of the RAND Center on Quality Policing. He studies illegal firearms markets and violence prevention initiatives and assists police and communities with law enforcement and race relations issues. He has worked with a number of major police departments on police community relations issues, including Oakland, New York, Los Angeles, and others. Ridgway is deeply involved in the research and analysis of contemporary police practices and has received several commendations and honors for his innovative use of statistics. The title of his talk today is Racial Profiling Analysis in a Post-Beer Summit World. Please welcome Greg Ridgway. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm glad to have uh, uh, such an in interesting audience to hear probably a topic that you don't get to talk much uh, about around here. Um, so today I'm, I'm going to be talking about racial profiling analysis, and uh, it's, it's something I've worked on on a lot, but it, it's come up sort of <coughs> as part of a line of work we've been doing for police departments around the country. Uh, police departments don't get a lot of analytical attention uh, in, in many times. It's not sort of part of their standard business traditionally. Um, but now they come across this topic of racial profiling analysis, and uh, others are doing their analysis for them, not always doing it well. So we're going to try to dive into, uh, into some of these, these issues. So racial profiling uh, has been a concern going back uh, several years, certainly stronger in the, in the minority communities in the US. Uh, it really came to sort of public, pu public prominence uh, in, the, in the 1990s uh, when there was a series of what are known as the I-95 Turnpike studies. Uh, the first one was uh, on the New Jersey Turnpike. Um, there was a, a lawsuit. The Federal Department of Justice brought a lawsuit against the New Jersey State Police uh, for racial profiling on the Turnpike. And so researchers uh, did something sort of interesting. They, uh, they collected data on who was being stopped and the race distribution of who was being stopped on the New Jersey Turnpike. And then they sent a car going down the New Jersey Turnpike, going around 60 miles an hour, and a passenger in the car would look at the cars that were passing them to, and record, okay, that looked like white, black, Latino, black, black, Latino, white, 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 and, 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 and then tabulated to see whether the race distribution of who was passing them in the car was uh, matched that of uh, the race distribution of who was being stopped. And they, and they didn't match. And there were some, some problems with this study. For example, I mean, if any of you are from New Jersey, who goes on the turnpike at 60 miles an hour? Yeah. So no one, no one goes 60 miles an hour on the turnpike. So everyone was, was flying, flying past them. And later studies looked at who was going 70 miles an hour, 80 miles an hour, and the results changed a little bit. The second study was on, on the Maryland, uh, through Mar I-95 through Maryland, and uh, that had similar uh, uh, results. So as a result of these uh, court cases, public concern, uh, the, there's, there's been a lot of legislation happening. Uh, about 14 states have passed legislation banning the practice of racial profiling, requiring police departments to collect data, uh, and that's led to a lot of different practices going on around the country. Uh, most recently, not so long ago, about two years ago, there was the, the high profile arrest of Henry Louis Gates, um, and that resulted in the, the infamous beer summit and uh, that renewed a lot of interest. And of course, what was on everybody's mind was what beers will be consumed at the beer summit. And, and I know that was gonna be peak in your interest, so I've listed what actually was consumed uh, uh, at that beer summit. Now, as much as racial profiling was uh, uh, involved in this discussion, it was also concern about the status of American beer brewing, uh, because many of the, uh, the selected beers are now uh, foreign brewed. But that was sort of a sideshow to uh, the main event. So racial profiling, there's, it's, it's a question that, that demands some sort of analysis. And there is, in fact, lots of analysis going on out there. Hundreds of studies, perhaps every year, are being produced trying to address the question about whether this department or that department are targeting uh, minorities in their community. Um, most of these studies are very weak. And they go either way, either in favor of, of the hypothesis of racial profiling or against it. And, the, and there's... Uh, several problems. Here are two of my, my favorite ones. Uh, in Texas, there was a study that, that concluded that 75% of agencies stop more black and Latino drivers than white drivers. Now, that's the sort of thing that makes headlines, but let's pause for a minute and think about this. Well, uh, 
in, uh, in Texas, uh, whites are actually in the minority now. So uh, I don't know whether it makes, uh, whether 100% of agencies should stop more black and Latino just because of the population. Now, the black, Latino, and whites are not uniformly mixed throughout, uh, throughout Texas, but if in fact they were uniformly mixed, I would expect 100% of departments to perhaps stop more black and Latino drivers. But there isn't, uh, it isn't sort of uniformly mixed. So I don't know in the end whether 75% is reasonable or not. There's not a good benchmark to compare that to. Now on the other hand, there are some studies that uh, sort of hastily defend the police department. For example, in Sacramento, uh, the percentage of black drivers stopped matched the percentage of blacks among crime suspect descriptions. And they said, okay, and since that's okay, uh, the department's okay. Now that's not satisfactory either because we don't stop people for uh, a traffic, we stop people for traffic offense, rolling through stop signs, speeding, r running a red light. Uh, we, we don't, the cops aren't stopping cars because uh, that person's an armed robbery suspect or was wanted in a mugging. No, that happens sometimes. But there's no reason that those two uh, should, should match. So it does go both, both ways. So now, let's get to uh, some methods that actually are transparent, that are uh, that, that really do address the key questions of interest. And I'm going to focus on three questions. Race bias in the decision to make a stop, internal benchmarking systems that assess whether individual officers are, are targeting uh, uh, minorities in their community, and lastly, looking at post-stop outcomes, uh, search rates, um, how long the stops take, and so on. So let's start off with a decision to make a stop. So, what makes this so hard? It seems like a very simple question. We should be able to construct two pie charts, uh, who's being stopped, who's at risk of being stopped, and compare them. Difference equals racial profile. So let's try to make an attempt at this. This is uh, uh, data from the city of Oakland, 2003, uh, my, my first study in, the area, uh, in this area. Um, in Oakland, they, from police statistics, they found that 56% of the individuals stopped were, uh, were black drivers, okay? Doesn't, not necessarily we, do we know whether that's too big or too small. We need some sort of benchmark to compare that to. And that's where the big uh, wrinkle is. What do we compare it to? So the easiest thing is what everybody jumps to is the census. And the two don't match. So 35% of Oakland uh, residents are black. And so 56% divided by 35% is 1.6, and that's the number that sort of gets touted in the press and in, in discussions and claims of, of racial profiling. Now, there's lots of other reasons why it could be uh, the same. Uh, th they could be differences. Uh, it could, in fact, be race bias. It could be that the, there are officers that are targeting minorities in the community, and that might explain some of this. But there are differences in driving behavior, car ownership. Uh, how much, how much time they spend on the road, uh, and the care with which they drive. For example, Hispanics are often um, are the ones most likely to wear their seatbelt. If, uh, if the uh, police are out in force uh, doing seatbelt violations, they should actually shouldn't stop many Hispanics in their community. There are differences of, uh, across race groups. And lastly, the big one in Oakland is that there are differences in exposure to the police. That is, in some areas, the flatlands in Oakland, there can be 10 times as many police officers as, as in the Oakland Hills. So if you drive one block uh, through the flatlands going 70 miles an hour, you're gonna be stopped right away. If you drive 70 miles, across the, uh, 70 miles per hour across the Oakland Hills, uh, you have a good chance of, of, of making that without being caught by a cop. You might run into something, some other obstacle, but not, not a police officer. So all these things mixed together formulate that difference of 1.6, and we can't attribute it that directly to racial profiling. So, but all is not lost. Uh, we have some other methods that we can use. So this is the, the approach that we took. We noted the ability to discriminate requires officers to identify the race of the drivers in advance. That is, think about the racially biased officer. In order to practice racial profiling, they've got to be able to see the race of the driver in advance and say, aha, that's the race group that I wanted to target. I'm going to go pursue a stop of this vehicle. Okay. Second, the ability to identify the race in advance of a stop decreases as it gets dark. And this is something you can test out on your way home this evening, or depending on when you get off from work, that when it's light out, it's reasonably easy to see the race of drivers in other cars. Not always, but it's easier. And at, wet and at night, it becomes more difficult. Now, it's not impossible, but it's more difficult. And that's all we need. 
So more details of this are in uh, the, a, uh, um, a paper uh, that I wrote in the Journal of the American Statistical Association. But using these two uh, features, I'll, I'll explain simply what we did. Let's look in Oakland. 50% of the drivers stopped in daylight were, were black, okay? Compare that to the percentage of black drivers that were stopped at night, 54%. And so this is actually runs counter to the racial pro profiling hypothesis. That is, if it's dark outside, the racially biased officers should have more difficulty identifying the race of the drivers in advance, uh, and we should see that number go down, but instead we see it go up. Now this naive analysis is, is far from perfect. We're looking at people driving during the day compared to people driving at night. People who drive during the day are different from those who drive at night. The police do different things during the day than they do at night. So all of these confound the analysis. So we, got, we can't just stop at this simple analysis. We've got to take it one step further. All right, I'm going to show you a graph. On the, on the horizontal axis, I've got clock time going from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. at night. On the vertical axis, I have hours since sunset. And so let me put some dots up there that represent stops. Each of these is a stop involving a driver. Now you can see uh, some, like let's take a look at this stop right here. This is a stop of a white driver that occurred at around 6.30 in the evening when 6.30 was about two hours before sunset. It's light outside, easier to see. Now sometimes 6.30 occurs after dark. Sometimes during the year it's dark at 6.30. And uh, these stops occurred at 6.30 when it's uh, an hour after sunset and it's dark. So we've got this great natural experiment going on that sometimes at 6.30 it's light outside and, some, uh, and sometimes it's dark outside. It gets even better. There's this gap right here where you see no stops going on. And this is, my, this is often puzzling why no stops occur in this band here. And it's because twice a year, we suddenly change the clocks from, to and from daylight savings time. So on one Monday, it's light out at 6.30, and the cops can see reasonably well into the other vehicles. And the following Monday, it's dark outside. Now, we don't think the mix of who's driving on the road suddenly switch from one Monday to the next Monday. We don't think suddenly there's going to be a lot more black drivers, more white drivers. The police don't change their patrol patterns just because it's, it's still at 6.30. Not, not, they don't change their patrol patrol patterns because of daylight savings time. So we've got this, this great natural experiment. The only thing different between that one Monday and the following Monday is that it's light out one, one Monday and it's dark out the following Monday, okay? So what do we do? Slice up this plot into little slivers. So we look, it just stops right around 6.30. And we see that 53% of the, uh, those stopped at 6.30 when it's light outside were black and 54% were stopped when it's dark outside. So that's just for 6.30. We can do this, repeat this analysis across all the different time slices. Uh, we can do some statistical modeling to smooth that out. And what we'll find is across uh, the, the, this time, you'll find equal rates of black and white being stopped. So that's what the analysis we did in Oakland. Uh, this is analysis that was actually uh, sat around a table with lots of people from the community, from the police, from the police union, from the ACLU, and the Citizen Police Review Board, and all these communities, and presented this analysis. And everyone sees that you know, there is not a difference, um, that the, the ability to see the race of the driver in advance is not influencing uh, who's getting stopped. We repeated this analysis in Cincinnati as well and came up with similar results. So that's looking at bias in the decision to make a stop. But that's not satisfactory either. In fact, departments and even the public don't necessarily think that it's a department-wide pattern. They don't think that the entire department is biased. But I think on both sides, there is agreement that there are probably a few bad apples in just about every organization of some size. Okay? And that gets to the second part. If, there, if you're not having problems at a department-wide level, how can you come up with practices and analysis that will identify those bad apples before they show up on the six o'clock news? Okay. So this is some work we did for the New York City Police Department. Here's an officer. This officer made 392 stops in 2006 of pedestrians, okay? 86% of those uh, pedestrians that this officer stopped were black. Sounds like a lot. Or maybe it's not. Depends on what part, of New York this, uh, what part of New York this officer works. Let's get a little bit more detail on this officer and what, uh, where, where, how this officer works. We know that 3% of this officer's stops occurred in January, 
We know that 13% occurred on Mondays. We know that 23% occurred between 8 and 10 p.m. We know that they were mostly in Brooklyn North in precincts B and C. That is, uh, um, that most of the stops occurred outside. Uh, most of the time, this officer made stops in uniform and so on. We know a lot about this officer. In fact, this is just a, a partial, partial list. So now what we can do is look for stops made by other officers that occurred in a similar time, place, and context. So I went through the database of other stops that were made, and I found about 37 stop, 100 stops made by other officers that match the officer in question stops. Stop occurred in the same time, same place, same context. Okay? So these officers should have been ex exposed to the same sort of suspicious characters, the same sort of uh, infractions and offenses, the same rates of jaywalking. They should all be seeing the same thing. They're doing the same job. In fact, it's even better. Uh, we have the XY coordinates of exactly where these stops are taking place. And uh, this, here's the officer in question. He looks like he's on a foot patrol, sort of walking up and down these three blocks. And here is a contour plot of where the benchmark, the, his, his peers that we're using to compare, uh, they're walking up and down that same block too. Okay. So now the big question, uh, how, what's the percentage of black uh, pedestrians that this officer's peers are stopping? And we find that 55% of those stops involve black pedestrians. That's a big difference, whether statistical or otherwise, that's, that's a big difference. Um, and now we've identified a particular problem. And uh, we repeat this analysis for the several thousand officers that are regularly involved in, in stopping uh, pedestrians in New York and identified five officers that are substantially stopping more black pedestrians than their peers. Did the same for, uh, for Latino pedestrians. Found another about eight or so officers that were stopping a lot more uh, Latino pedestrians than their peers. Now, We've, uh, we've uh, developed a system that's been deployed in Cincinnati, and I'll talk a bit more about Cincinnati in a second. Uh, it's sort of a web-based system that is constantly monitoring officers' activities, and they run quarterly reports, and every quarter they flag about, say, four or five, six officers, and um, this has turned out to be a very useful program for them. Now, these six officers that they flag, uh, the chief has told me, well, let's say they, f they end up falling into three categories. Um, maybe uh, one category that they knew about. Yes, there has been a problem with these two officers that were flagged. Uh, they've got complaints. We've had some other uh, administrative problems with them. I've assigned them to a senior field training officer. They've got six months to shape up or ship out. That's, and that's exactly the sort of thing that we want to, to highlight. Uh, another two, they'll have a good explanation. That officer was on a special gang detail. He was uh, targeting a specific gang for nine months last year. That's a variable that is not in this benchmark calculation that we did. Fine, I'm glad that they were able to sort of sort out that question and get that addressed. And the other two officers, they didn't know about. No other signs of problems, no other signs of anything going on. Uh, let's you know, mark that, have the supervisor discussion uh, with that officer, and see how things go over the, over the next quarter, the next six months. And this is exactly the kind of discussion that we want police executives to have about managing their police force. It's not a, necessarily an indictment of the officers that are flagged here, but it's a step for flagging among the thousands of officers doing work. Can you identify some of those that re re require uh, more, um, more follow-up. And there's more details about all the gory statistical methods behind it, again, in, a, in another uh, um, Journal of the American Statistical Association paper uh, that came out in 2009. Um, and for the statisticians uh, among you, uh, the, the methodology, I think, is, is quite, quite clever. You might find it useful in your own work. It blends sort of three statistical methods that are in, uh, in being developed, uh, uh, modern statistical methods that are uh, um, the target of a lot of, of research that includes a propensity score estimation, uh, doubly robust estimation, and false discovery rates. And it sort of combines these three methods to, uh, to identify um, potential problems in the police department. The last thing, so we've talked about race bias and the decision to make a stop, the department-wide. We've talked about potential problems with individual officers. Now let's talk about a third step about looking at activity after the stop takes place. There's a lot of different ways that this can be done. 
One, we can actually audit police interaction with the public. And we've done this. We've collected uh, several hundred videotapes uh, from those in-car cameras that you see on the cop show. And we watched them and we, had, we coded them. We, we looked for uses of terms of respect on the part of the officer, on the part of the driver. Um, uh, did the officer have his hand on his gun? Did he walk with his back? Lots of things you can um, code from these. And there are some interesting things that can come out of that. Um, one interesting thing is we found that black officers and white officers uh, in the particular community we were studying are different. They ask different questions. In fact, the black officers tended not to ask many questions. They, you know, man, you rolled to a stop sign, here's your ticket, off you go. Very simple interaction. The white officers tended to be much more proactive. They saw the stop as an opportunity to do investigation. Where are you going? Do you have any uh, contraband in the car? Um, who uh, ask IDs from the others in, uh, other passengers in the car? These are two different but valid approaches to, to policing. Now, if you're a young black man in this community and you have a very different experience with a black officer and a white officer, you're not going to just attribute that to different frameworks of policing. I think it's reasonable to expect that, that young black man to attribute that to race bias. So there are some things that a department could do to reduce the appearance the, uh, and the perception of, of, racial bi of race bias in their policing. So that's something that we, we got out of uh, looking at these police videos. Um, it's also often common practice to look at hit rates after the stop takes place. Do you, find, uh, do you do a search and are those searches productive in the sense that you found drugs, weapons, or something like that? That's uh, an, an interesting v uh, avenue to take. So what we're going to look at is comparing uh, black and white uh, drivers in similar situations and look at stop outcomes. And more details are on the paper in the Journal of Quantitative Criminology if you want to look up the details on this. So let's take a look at what happened in Cincinnati. Now Cincinnati, you might remember, was uh, about 10 years ago now, uh, was the, the site of uh, riots following the, uh, the shooting of Timothy Thomas. Um, and uh, that led to uh, about a five, six year federal oversight of the Cincinnati Police Department. Now that department is, is quite a change department from where it was 10 years ago. Um, it's winning awards, it's, it's sort of a, a model department in many ways. At the time we were doing this analysis, they were in the middle of a, a court settlement uh, with uh, a class action lawsuit on uh, civil rights violations. So let's take a look at what was happening in Cincinnati at that time. Uh, if we look at black drivers, in, uh, in one year, uh, about 27,000 black drivers were stopped in Cincinnati. 55% of them had stops lasting less than 10 minutes. And this is about as long as a stop should take if everything's sort of simple. You ran a stop light, let me run your, your license, and every, you got a ticket, off you go. Should stop, those stops should last less than 10 minutes. So black drivers, about 55% of the time, they had one of these stops, these short stops. On the other hand, non-black drivers, and I use the term non-black drivers, in Cincinnati that's essentially white drivers, um, but 65% of them had stops lasting less than 10 minutes. So the, the white drivers in Cincinnati were experiencing much shorter stops more frequently than the black drivers. So why, why is this a big question? And now this difference is the kind of thing that makes the headlines. Big difference, big disparity between our black, black, how black drivers and white drivers are treated in our community. But there is more to the story. Let's have a look at that. Just like with the officers, we know a lot of detail about these stops. For example, take a look at uh, the, the uh, driver's licenses. 22% of black drivers stopped in Cincinnati did not have a valid driver's license. Now, I think everyone can agree that if you don't have a valid driver's license, regardless of your race, that's going to take more time on the part of the police. Um, the Over the Rhine neighborhood, this is the site of the, uh, of the, of the riots uh, several years ago. Um, 9% of the black drivers were stopped in the Over the Rhine neighborhood, uh, while 5% uh, of the white drivers were stopped in Over the Rhine. Now, policing might just be different. Uh, Over the Rhine is a, is a high crime neighborhood, or it certainly was during this period, uh, and policing was very different. And, you, and those police you know, might have asked a lot more questions of anyone stopped in that neighborhood. 93% uh, of black drivers uh, were Cincinnati residents, whereas 61% of the white drivers were Cincinnati residents. Now you might wonder whether uh, the Cincinnati police should be 
treating the Kentucky drivers differently from the Cincinnati drivers, but it's possible that there are factors other than, uh, than race at play here. All right, so now that we know all these differences, what do we do about it? If we see that, we don't know now whether that difference between 55% and 65% is due to race or it's due to one of these other factors that's listed in this table. Yes? You got it. No, other way around. Of those, of the black drivers stopped, 9% were stopped in over the Rhine. Okay. Um, and you look at, you know, one of the other ones, you know, the, the I-75, you know, only, uh, of the black drivers, 4% were stopped on I-75, one of the major freeways there, while 11% of the white drivers. So the white drivers are just, have, they're, they're stopped in different contexts. Uh, you know, the, the kinds of stops that occur on the freeways are different from those that occur inside the city. And that may or may not impact the, the, the length of a stop, but it's a factor that we see that are different between black and white. So let's try to get, so this comparison now is more than just comparing black and white, it's comparing black and white in different contexts as an apples to oranges comparison. So let's try to get at an apples to apples comparison. So what I did is identified non-black drivers that were stopped at the same time, same place, same context as the black drivers in Cincinnati. So have a look. Now we've got uh, stops involving white drivers where 20% of them had invalid driver's licenses. 10% uh, of them were stopped in over the Rhine. 92% uh, of them were Cincinnati residents. So in all respects, within one or two percentage points, we've got white drivers that were stopped at the same time, same place, same context as the black drivers, okay? So any difference we observe between these 27,000 uh, black drivers and these 5,000 white drivers, that's not due to time, place, context. That's more likely due to race. So now let's see what the results are there. Of those, of those white drivers, 57% of them had stops lasting less than 10 minutes, okay? So much of the difference between the 55% and the 65% has to do with factors other than race. It has to do with time, place, context. Now there is still a difference, but the difference is 55% and 57%. That's still a difference. And, and if you're the, uh, the black driver that has a stop lasting excessively long, that's, this, is no, uh, this is no consolation. Um, but the fact is this is the number that, that the public needs to worry about and, and discuss and debate. Let's look at search rates, another outcome. Um, and this is over several, several years. We see that searches of non-black drivers vary between about 2.6 and 3% of stops of, of white drivers uh, result in searches. On the other end, uh, here are, look, these, these white dots out here. The stops involving black drivers are out here at more like 6, 7%, okay? So, on the face of it, we've got large differences between the search rates of, of black drivers and the search rates of white drivers. A lot more searching of black drivers is occurring in Cincinnati. Now, let's do the same thing again. These stops occur at different time, places, contexts. Let's match them up. Let's find there's a black driver stopped in this neighborhood at this time. Let's find a white driver stopped at the same time, place, context, and check out the search rates. And that's the comparison between the, the blue dot and the white dot. And if you notice in the most recent year I have data on, 2008, the white drivers stopped at the same time, place, context, or actually searched more than the black drivers in those neighborhoods. In fact, that pattern is consistent for the last three years, 2006 through, th through, th through 2008. Yes? I think they were surprised, although there have been some theories that the, of what's known as depolicing, that the police will back off when faced with, you know, with court challenges and civil rights uh, accusations, which might not be a bad thing in the end for improving police community relations, improving public safety, and, uh, and so on. So it could be that you know, encounter a black driver and maybe this cop normally would have done a search or a thing, and now, Given you know the, the the scrutiny, you know backs off some, and uh, I, we don't we don't have evidence of this. We don't have this documented, 
Uh, there are people that sort of talk about this sort of thing happening, um, and, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. All right, so I was, I was asked, uh, uh, how do I pick the matches to make sure they're sort of within the same context? Um, I use the finest data that I have available. So in Cincinnati, what I had was the neighborhood level. They've si sliced up Cincinnati into, uh, I think, 53 neighborhoods. Most of them are fairly small that we would feel like it's called, it really is a neighborhood. And so at the best level, I could match on neighborhood. Uh, in the New York example, you saw that I actually had XY coordinates. And so I matched the entire distribution of X, the distribution of the XY coordinates to make sure that those overlap. Um, same with time. I'm, at, I'm ma matching the continuous distribution of, of time, making sure that those are as close as I can get. Okay. So in closing, uh, I've gone through three examples um, uh, noting that uh, it's not, in the end, that hard to do good analysis of, of, of ra the racial profiling issue. Now, there's a lot of naive analysis out there. I mentioned the, the census comparison. I've mentioned the sort of the naive comparison of, let's compare uh, the search rate for whites and the search rates for blacks, and any differences there must be racial profiling. Um, so that, uh, I've sort of dismissed those um, as reasonable analyses. But I've also shown that it doesn't take that much effort to push it just a little bit farther, to do a real transparent calculation, get the apples to apples comparison, match black and white uh, drivers stopped in the same context, match officers with other officers that are patrolling the same time, place, and context. And when I present this uh, to whether it's a police union or a community group, it's, it's done in uh, just much as you've seen it here. It's very transparent and easy to, to understand. There's nothing that technical. Now, but under the hood, there's a lot of statistics work to try to make sure the matches look good and, uh, and things like that. But in the end, the, the tables that I've shown you uh, say, say it all. And if you want uh, more detail on any of these studies, you can visit the Center on Quality Policing website. That's cqp.ran.org. Um, all of our reports are, are always free, uh, downloadable on the web, as are uh, all of other, RAND's other reports. This is not unique just to our policing work. Um, but you're happy to sort of dive in and learn more about the, the research there. Thank you. And we're happy to take questions if there's anyone. So I didn't catch in your present, first thanks for coming and, uh, and for speaking. I didn't quite catch, um, if you looked at the data for like what are the results of, of one of the traffic stops? Like does, is there, a, is there always a citation? Sometimes citation, right. sometimes not? So what I talked, the two examples I gave were uh, of outcomes were whether a search occurs, whether, um, and whether the length of the stop was less than 10 minutes. But we also looked at whether, um, whether a citation occurred, whether a warning occurred, whether an arrest occurred, whether the person was asked to step out of the car. There's lots of other things that you can also track. And it just depends on what the police have good data on. Um, and Cincinnati being under a, a consent decree with the, with, uh, as a result of this class action lawsuit um, actually had really good data, that they had a really good auditing process, they had uh, monitoring going on, and they were actually collecting very rich data. So we did look at all those questions. Now, I noted, in these examples, sort of looking at across the entire city, you know, generally didn't find uh, uh, large uh, race disparity issues. That turns out it's not always the case. It did some work in New York where we found some neighborhoods um, where there was no evidence of race bias, but others where there were large differences, even after this matching by time, place, context, you would find neighborhoods in New York where, there, where uh, black, uh, pedestrians were still frisked more, searched more, arrested more, uh, had more use of force used against them, and there was no explanation, um, you know, that, that no excuse that could be made other than, uh, uh, you know, it wasn't time, place, context. It had to be some, something else, and perhaps, and race bias was one of the remaining candidates. Uh, have you found that, um, in general, uh, as a trend, that police departments are um, becoming much more I don't know, uh, amenable to or interested in statistical analysis, just beyond racial profiling, but in uh, general? Uh, uh, there's a, a lot of variability. 
So there are, some there are certainly some departments that are doing a lot of data collection. Uh, you take the Chicago Police Department, for example, as, as a good model here. They have an award-winning uh, uh, data warehouse called the Clear System. They compile lots of data, both on sort of operational aspects to, to attack the, the crime problem, but also on public complaints. So all of those are tracked uh, really well. What's not happening yet is, is a lot of strategic analysis based on that. They've got a lot of tactical information. If you want to know about a particular address, you can pull in lot from lots of data sources, lots of information about the problems uh, at that particular address. But now you want to look at, say, across all addresses that are problems and look for patterns, and uh, that's where it's become more challenging. They've developed a uh, predictive analytics group, uh, which is a, a sort of a new thing uh, in policing, and they're being able to forecast tomorrow, just like the weather, there's a strong chance of a, of a gang retaliation shooting in this one block area, let's move some resources in. And I think there, that's sort of the limit uh, and, and where things are heading. So there are some departments that are very progressive in this way. Two questions. Um, how is your work funded? And uh, second, how, what kind of reactions do you get from people from the community and from police when you present this information? Yeah, so the funding issue, so RAND as a whole gets funding from a variety of sources, primarily the federal government, but also from foundations, from private uh, donors and philanthropists, from, uh, um, and contracts from, uh, from cities. This particular work, I've, I've blended together several projects. So the city of Oakland was a grant from the National Institute of Justice. Uh, Cincinnati was a contract with the city that as part of this court settlement. So in some sense, we're reporting to the, to the city, but also re reporting to the federal monitor who was reporting to the federal judge. Uh, New York was with the New York City Police Foundation um, where they were trying to get ahead of the problem before uh, it, it, it got worse. Now, uh, the second question was the reaction. W wide range. Those who are sort of on the front lines of this uh, uh, get it. Uh, they, they think these are the right questions and the right approaches. They appreciate the transparency of the methodology. So I presented this to police chiefs, police unions, community uh, uh, organizations like the ACLU, um, and they get it and, and they buy into it and they want to do more. So can we? So we found, didn't find problems here. Let's start looking over in this space and apply those methods there to see if there's issues there. Um, there are always exceptions to that. There's always, uh, I've been at several community meetings where someone looks at me, says, white guy, blue eyes, we're tired of white guys with blue eyes looking at this data. We need you know, someone with the real look. Now, the good thing about this is they can count the same numbers that I did, and then still in the end, they will count 55% are searched and 57% uh, of the whites are searched. So in the end, it's just counting. So there's not really a lot of, of statistical tricks going on here. And that's a good thing about this. Thanks for the presentation. I, yeah. I don't think I caught the first part of, so this data reflects actual violations of crime when these individuals are being pulled over, or it's the genesis is more based solely on race of what, so, the data so, that you're getting? So the traffic stops are, are all traffic stops. The, um, now, allegedly, they're stopped for a reason, for some uh, traffic citation or you know, uh, a suspect, uh, one for a suspect, but that's, uh, they should be stopped for some, for some reason. Same with the, uh, the pedestrians, the, the stops involving pedestrians. They, in New York, in order to make a stop of a pedestrian, they have to be suspected of a penal code violation. There is sort of a standard. If, if they just go up and talk to someone and say, hey, how's it going? You know, that's, not, that's not the level that would show up in this data. And then the second question is, how is the police department, how do they train the officers? Are they, is this profiling in the broadest sense part of the training that they have? Or do you find that uh, this r issue of racial profiling is just endemic in on the job course of action? No, I mean, I think uh, the, the, the official training, I mean, they tr train, try to train out racial bias. I mean, in fact, uh, 
Uh, NYPD has done some innovative programs of bringing people to, uh, to uh, you know, entire recruit classes to black neighborhoods and have that community sort of yell at them about all the problems that, they're, that they've had so the police, that the new recruits can sort of understand the abuses that have happened in this, in this neighborhood so that when they're policing that neighborhood, this doesn't, they don't uh, police in the same way of, of the past. Um, now, there, there are sort of case, certainly cases where things go wrong and, and officers uh, ab you know, uh, abuse their, their police powers um, for racial reasons, for non-racial reasons. Um, and so I, I don't think the, the training, the anti-racial -pro profiling training is up to the level that, that needs to happen, uh, nor is it applied. There are 17,000 law enforcement agencies across this country. There's a lot of variability in the quality of training of any kind, uh, much less uh, issues of racial profiling. Um, I think that's still a work in progress. Yes. I had a comment about your uh, traffic stop study, where you said that it's it's much more difficult to tell if somebody is black or white, you know, after dark. Yeah. But the, I think the cars probably are similar. Yep. I mean, you can you can kind of go with this whole like you know, black people in a car potentially have a different type of car, different modifications yeah, that's, so or that, whatever. Yeah, th this issue um, doesn't bias the test, but it, it undercuts the statistical power of the test. In the same way, if the city was lit up at night, you know, it doesn't undercut the, it doesn't bias the test, that the, the statistical test, but it underpowers it because some fraction of those, some at the nighttime stops, half the stops are still lit up like they are during the day, and half of them are dark like, like we need them to. Um, it's, a, it's essentially an instrumental variable analysis and things like the, um, using car, the car type as a proxy or street lighting undercut the quality of the instrument to, 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 separate, to uh, predict visibility. Um, so indeed, if car type was completely correlated with the race of the driver, then uh, then the the instrument is no longer valid, and this and it's just you you always get a null result out of this. Um, but we've got to assume that there are at least some drivers in a Honda Accord that are white, and some other drivers in a Honda Accord that are black. And uh, even though they take that into account, no, there's no need there's no, no. need to because um, that the mix of cars on the road won't change between when it's light out and when it's dark out. Uh, sorry, th th there isn't. A need to do that for reasons of, of bias, but uh, the only thing that you could do is to um, to improve the power is, you know, then you start having to eliminate intersections that are well lit um, from the analysis, things like that. You know, might might improve the power of the of the statistical power of the test. So in your study, you control for context, where, when, and what, like, what time of the day it was. Right. Uh, do you also control for the possibilities that certain categories would violate rules more often? Because that wouldn't, then that would disprove that it's actually racial bias. You just, just police doing its work if the car is speeding. And if, say, tall people speed more, then it's not bias against tall people, just tall people speed more. Do you control for that? Yeah, so not in the decision to make a stop. Um, that, that part's really hard, I think, to, in the, decision, the first part, in your decision to make a stop, uh, because there is a lot of police discretion in who to stop and who not to stop. And there are studies that say if a cop follows you for uh, a mile, he'll find some reason to stop anyone. So in the other parts, I'm dealing with stops, police activity that happens after the stop takes place. So the decision to search, decision to write a citation, things, things like that. And there we sort of at least, the stop has met the level of the police have, it's past the police's discretion that this is someone I needed to stop for some reason. Now if we start finding differences in the search rates, that uh, say the search rates of blacks are much lower than search rate rates of whites, um, then you might wonder, maybe a lot of those stops shouldn't have happened in the first place because they're stopping people and going, oh, this is the wrong guy, or oh, I didn't really need to stop this person. So if we found large differences in search rates or large differences in citation rates, uh, that would lead you to that conclusion. Now, we're not seeing those large differences. We're seeing smaller differences, uh, differences nonetheless. So there might be some of that going on, but not at a, not at a large magnitude. Yeah. 
Uh, you also have another thing going on with trying to figure out who to stop is that you have to measure who you didn't stop, and that's pretty hard. Uh, yeah, so the, some of the original, some of the other studies will actually have like, you know, graduate students standing on clipboards, you know, standing with clipboards at intersections, watch cars go by, much like the New Jersey study, and say, okay, well, that's a you know, white guy, white guy, you know, black guy, and, and trying to record this down. Um, the, and the, but then not everybody that passes by is at risk for being stopped by a cop. And so then they try to say, well, let's make this a little bit more difficult. Let's uh, put a radar gun and say, well, all right, let's just get the race distribution of who's exceeding the speed, by, speed limit by five miles per hour. And then, well, cops aren't stopping everyone that's oh, in five miles an hour. They're looking for other things, uh, brake lights out, seatbelt violations. And so the list of things that you try to get the graduate student to record gets difficult. Now, the good thing about the, uh, the daylight savings time analysis I described is um, we don't have to d worry about that. We just have to d assume police practice is the same, you know, at 630, regardless of, of which side of daylight savings time you're on. Um, so they can do whatever it is that they normally do, whoever they usually stop, but uh, um, we, get to, we, skip all, we get to skip all that. I actually have two questions. I'll just ask one now. But what you said the police practice is the same regardless of whether it's day or night at 6:30. I was just wondering if that's actually you stated that kind of as an assumption. But is that yeah. is that true? Is it, well, I mean, with the exception, we do drop like headlight violations, for example, uh, because you know during those only happen when it's when it's uh, uh, dark out, and there might be differences in race of whether uh, um, you know uh, differences in uh, whether you have headlight violations between black and white. So we, we drop some things like that. Now, I've, I've talked to the police, say, you know, what happens when it's dark out? I'm like, oh, no, we're on a strict shift basis, so we don't re reallocate our force. Um, you know, our shift ends at whatever, 9 o'clock, whether it's before or after daylight savings time. So our, our, our allocation is the same. Um, and in the end, they look for the same sorts of things, you know, running red lights, rolling through stop signs, uh, speeding, things like that. Yeah, I mean, I actually think it's a reasonable assumption. I'm just pointing it out because uh, it is an assumption, and yep. you know, it could be questioned. You know, you, you know, hypothetically, uh, maybe there are people that are only uh, racially biased during the daytime or nighttime. You know, so that would completely strange. mess up this analysis. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's right. Some, but it becomes absurd. Yeah, when it gets dark, I turn into. Uh, a racial profile. Can I just make a brief comment on that? Because if you remember the Stanford prison experiment that you may be familiar with, where a Stanford uh, psychology professor had, I th oh, yeah. uh, under, I think undergrad students, doesn't matter, undergrad or grad, uh, one group was prisoners, one group was guards, and then uh, inevitably, uh, I guess, uh, the guards started torturing the prisoners. And um, uh, Actually, the people who wanted to commit these atrocities in this experiment did prefer the night shift, and they did act at the ni during the night shift. Yeah, but remember, remember though that it's the same. Uh, it's the same people. Uh, six thirty is not necessarily in the night shift, but or there, it's the same people that are going to be there when six thirty is light out and when six thirty is dark. So it is. It would be pro now the first analysis, the naive analysis that just compared daylight to darkness. We're talking about different people. The, the people that are getting in trouble with the police while well, you're sent to the midnight shift, you know, that those sorts of things are our problem with the naive just daylight darkness analysis. That's why we got to really slice it up by clock time. Yeah. Uh, how do you determine like at what locations you're actually collecting the data from, and does the location either validate or disvalidate the results that you're getting? I mean, to me, it seems like yeah. if you're in a predominantly Latin community, that you're going to probably have more Latin population violating a certain rule or wh wherever ethnicity that you find yourself. So how do you go about? So I get, I get all the data, uh, all police activity throughout, across the city. So for New York City, no matter, you know, if there's a stop that takes place, I, I want the data on it. So uh, th there's no selection on that. Now, if I'm looking at search, if there's a, a concern about the high level of uh, the search rate of, of black pedestrians in New York City, I want to look at the distribution across the city of where stops of black pedestrians occur. Now, and they're different from where stops of Latinos and stops of whites occur and stops of Asians occur. But if we're concerned about the search rate of, of black pedestrians, let's look at the distribution of where, where they occur. 
and let's find stops of whites that occurred in those same times, place, context, and match those up to the same distribution. These other methods that, I, that I'm not so, such a fan of do have to pick an intersection to station a graduate student to write down on a clipboard and selecting those uh, if you do it, uh, there are good ways, statistical ways of doing that, just like you would uh, standard statistical design of experiments, you know, randomly pick intersections, things like that. Um, you can do it well, and you can also do it poorly. <laughs> I came across um, a nice piece of work where some police departments are scheduling shifts based on the weather forecast because they've got the correlations between what kinds of things the police need to do as a function of actual instantaneous weather so they can schedule shifts for the next few days based off the weather forecast. I can see a real financial benefit to them doing that because the, it lets them keep their staffing level lower. Um, so the data collection that tracks stuff as a function of weather um, is completely offset. How much additional collection effort is there for the police force to get from that level of collection that's got a direct financial benefit through to this one which has a reducing your risk of somebody getting really irritated with you benefit. Oh, so here, the yeah. risk is lawsuits. So yeah, but I mean, how, how, what's the collection effort for the uh, police force um, to provide you the data set that you can then analyze? Uh, well, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. I mean, a lot of departments aren't collecting anything on, on their interactions with the public. There's about 14 to 15 states that require all the police departments to collect data on all stops, so they've got to do it anyway. California, it's no requirement for police to document interactions with the public. Some cities, the first one was San Jose, although I don't know that they're still doing it. Um, they did it sort of voluntarily because they thought it would be a good thing to track for just because that was part of their business. You track things that are at your core business. Um, uh, LA did it because of a uh, lawsuit. So uh, now, I don't know if these departments would do it because of, for necessarily for business. Not all, so a lot of departments will say that it's just a waste of money and officer time to collect this data that is never gonna be looked at, or if it's looked at, it's gonna be looked at poorly. Um, so there, that's certainly a complaint that I, that, I, that I hear. I guess a follow-up question, uh, or phrasing that in a different way might be, uh, are there policy implications for states and the federal government uh, for this kind of data collection, or would it really be that um, to have a blanket collection of data would be just way too much overkill, and it's better to target areas where, there, uh, where people believe there's a problem, where there are lawsuits, and so on? Yeah. So, so there's a, a, some federal legislation called the End of Racial Profiling Act. It's been introduced into Congress just about every, every term for the last four terms, most recently in, in 2010. And there's sort of four pieces to this. I'm not sure I'll remember all of them. Um, but essentially, it, it bans the practice of racial profiling in the United States. That's actually not been clearly stated by the federal government uh, uh, prior to this. Um, the, uh, and then the, uh, the other part is, is to require all, any police department receiving federal funds to collect data on, on traffic stops and report on it. So there is sort of this movement to make all departments do it. I'm not sure that's necessarily cost beneficial. Any time the Justice Department sort of, uh, this, the Justice Department um, through section 14141 of, uh, off, uh, this is the, the power that gives the Justice Department the authority to investigate bring lawsuits against police departments that are, have suspected patterns or practice of, of, of civil rights violations. So when those, come, when those sorts of come up, the first thing they do is you're gonna start doing data collection. And it's not just on traffic stops, it's on any sort of public contact, it's about any arrest you make, it's about any use of force you make, any use of dogs, uh, start collecting data. That's sort of the first line of, of, of business that they uh, require at the first stage. And that seems like a reasonable practice. And, but I also don't think it necessarily has to be the U.S. Department of Justice that makes that happen. Any community that is concerned about the, that has suspicions of its police department or feels that, that there's a deterioration of police community relations, one of the first things that that police department can do is says, we're going to start collecting data and monitoring this and report to the public in a transparent way 
to make sure we don't get to the point where the Department of Justice is knocking on our door, doing an investigation, or filing a lawsuit. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. It's actually uh, not uh, too hard to, to validate uh, this. So, for example, in Cincinnati, um, when they stop someone, they call into dispatch, you know, take me out of the pool because I'm, for the next 10, 15 minutes, I'm going to be dealing with this traffic stop. And so uh, we get a record from the dispatch. This guy was engaged in a traffic stop, and we look for the corresponding form. And that just at least gets to the existence of a traffic stop taking place. Now, whether it's what's on the form, whether that whether search actually took place or didn't take place, that's that's uh, not necessarily that's harder to to audit. What certainly happens is if the person comes in with a complaint and says I was searched, and the form says they weren't searched, and then they got the in-car camera that shows the officer searching, but it's not on the form, that's a big problem, and every, every officer knows that it's not worth you know, fudging the form uh, because this, this sort of thing can, can happen. Okay, one last question. Oh, only one last. Um, I'll, st I'll stick around if you want to oh, ask well, more. A quick follow-up to that is just uh, that, because uh, earlier you talked about um, when they stop pedestrians and they just talk to them, and you said, well, that's not a stop, so they mm -hmm. don't do the data collection. Same thing here. If they, if they were to stop someone and not call dispatch, then they don't have a record of it. Is it possible? You know, that's an example of harassment or something that's not so documented. If it, so now we're talking the difference between pedestrian stops and a traffic stop. Well, so no, a traffic stop, a traffic they, stop as well, they, where they stop someone but don't call dispatch. They would, uh, Hypothetically. It, it could vary by department, but uh, in Cincinnati they would call dispatch because otherwise they're on call. Like if a 911 call comes in and they're out of their car, you know, dealing with the traffic stop, that's... Well, I'm not alleging that it's happening. I'm saying that hypothetically a, a policeman can stop someone, get out of their car, and not call dispatch. This would be an example of bad yeah, apple. Yeah. Okay. And but the other question I wanted to ask had more to do with them earlier when you're talking about in Oakland, how in the Oakland Hills they don't have as many police, yeah. presumably because there's not as much uh, crime in the Oakland Hills. Uh, but um, again, not alleging this is happening. But like, is there? There's also the potential that um, when you have more police in an area. Uh, you're likely to find more crime. So for the example of speeding tickets, if you had more pe police in Oakland Hills, yeah. more people would be getting speeding tickets. Um, but you don't put police there because speeding tickets are not considered to be like as important as the, as concentrating, like looking for other other types of crime. Uh, so I guess what I'm getting to I, is I, I there, get it. I get it. Is so, it the potential of racial bias and how you distribute the police? Yes. So, I mean, that is a legitimate concern that... Uh, that the, the reason why there's such disparities, you've got 10 times more police officers in a black neighborhood than in a white neighborhood. Now this is different from racial profiling, that is the individual officers are targeting uh, uh, black residents, black drivers, black pedestrians. Um, but it's a, it's a very different problem. And the good thing is it has an easy solution. It just involves moving officers somewhere out. And that, that's something that can be negotiated with the community, with the police department, and with the, with the political bodies in that, in that community. But it's a very different problem from racial profiling. So New York could solve many of its uh, racial disparities simply by reallocating a lot more officers to, say, Manhattan South. But then what you'll find is, you know, next year there'll be complaints about uh, the response times to calls in, uh, in Queens. Uh, so and you'll find biases there next year that you didn't find this year as a result of that. So there is this balance between getting the allocation uh, that the community wants, and uh, uh, but that doesn't um, sort of exacerbate the disp racial disparities that you're most concerned about, like response time. Well, what do you mean control for it? Control, is there a way to statistically control for that? Uh, I don't want to control for it. I mean, I want to, because this is the way the police are functioning right now. So I want to, and I'm trying to detect whether individual officers or the department as a whole is, is targeting uh, minorities in their community. Okay, so
So right. So now you're saying like, is the does the allocation of police officers make sense in some way? Uh, and there's there's a lot of different ways that police are allocated. So some have you know uh, their computer programs. There's companies that you know develop allocation models just based on you, you, you input the, the points of your stations and, and things like that and where your calls are coming from. And it says, and it does all your staffing and things like that. And it's, it's race blind. So because the computer just knows locations of, of cars and resources and, and to the demand for service. And so that's a safe way of doing it. But then uh, uh, politicians will also weigh in. And usually it's uh, every community uh, turns out wants more police service in in their area. They might not like their you know the quality they're getting, but most communities, the political leadership will be arguing for more police in their neighborhood rather than in that other neighborhood that doesn't need it so much. Big battle in Chicago uh, about this. Okay, I think we're uh, out of time. So uh, okay. thank you, Greg, for uh, coming. Sure, glad to be here.